So I want to play a couple of clips for you guys today. So uh, here's the first one. Okay, now the other one. All right, I'm going to play that one more time. The first one. And the second. Can you hear the difference? Okay, this time let's do it with the sampled instrument. Here's the first phrase. And now the second. With the first example, uh, the Arterias Mini Moog, the phrase has got that glide turned on, which makes it so much more expressive and musical. Same goes for the French horn sampled instrument example. Uh, clearly, in this context for that phrase, uh, the legato mode with the slur, meaning uh, connecting the notes without any gaps, is so much more expressive than if you were to play the samples without it. So what of it? Well, this really hit me. And it took me down this rabbit hole that made me question a lot of things. Uh, we musicians and composers obsess about sound and the tone of something like a lot. Uh, from guitar, violins, amps, microphones, mic pre's, vintage modern, analog versus digital, uh, we're always like searching but never quite quenched. When it comes to synthesizers and frankly any computer, laptop, sample generated electronic music, because we're the agent for those sources, uh, we have to pay special attention to how those are played. Uh, in those examples with the Moog or the sampled instrument, it doesn't matter if Moog was the real $5,000 Moog or the most expensive orchestral sample library, right? Because they would still be lifeless without expression. I recently watched this certain movie trailer in which this synth phrase was used with great effect. In fact, it got me so inspired I wanted to make a video out of it. But as I was trying to decide on which synth to use to recreate that sound, it started to really dawn on me. Uh, whether I used a real hardware Minimoog, my Mother 32 or the Minotaur, or even the software emulation of the Arteria, uh, a plug-in version of the Minimoog, the magic was really in the glide, the expression, uh, or more specifically, the articulation. You could approximate that sound with any synth, but if you take away that glide, that expression, it loses everything. Okay, I know it sounds obvious, but it doesn't mean that we don't need a reminder now and then. If you compare the amount of effort and resource we put into getting our tone just right, instead of making our music feel more expressive, and I'm guilty of this, uh, I think you can make a pretty good case on some level of this imbalance. Uh, or a, a lack of emphasis on one over the other. And I'm just going to say it, this imbalance, this wrong emphasis at times, directly correlates with our unhealthy obsession about gear. Here is a great example and the reason why I purchased the Isanine, which is considered by some as the true analog heir to the Jupiter 8. In fact, originally this video was going to be about the Isanine. And I will do a video on it, but I just needed to make this video first because of my recent realizations. When we see the great vintage Jupiter 8, what do we think? Well, first off, we're thinking about the sound, those analog oscillators, uh, the tone. But we're also remembering the song that it was in. The synth either was the inspiration for the song or perhaps magnified the greatness of the song. It was the song. That's why a great song can be made into any genre, right? You can take a country song and make it hip hop or R&B, uh, or you can take an R&B uh, song and make it into an EDM track or a classical opera, perhaps. 
A great memorable song transcends genre, sound, or tone. And that's what we're striving for, right? Isn't it? I mean, it doesn't mean tone isn't important, and it is, but it just feels out of balance at times. Uh, and when it comes to writing a great song, a great compelling song, a great portion of that has to do with expression. Gear manufacturers know that tone sells, so they lean into it really hard. And it works. The nostalgia. Throwback synths have just absolutely taken over the market, uh, even our obsession with analog. But at some point, you can only do so much with tone. A musical idea performed expressively on a random digital synth plugin, I say is far superior than some lifeless performance on any rare vintage, super expensive analog synthesizer. Now I get that tone wasn't as widely accessible in the early days of the recording industry. So bands and musicians used tone as a way to differentiate themselves from others, right? Nothing sounded like a Jupiter 8, and nothing sounded like a CS80, for example. But now, technology has brought a, a level playing field of sorts when it comes to accessibilities to those tones. Soft synths, hardware synths, digital analog, they all sound really, really good especially when performed expressively. So I guess what I'm saying is, I want my balance back. Uh, instead of obsessing so much about tone, but obsessing about expression. So here's my hot take on why we naturally settle towards tone instead of expression. And as always, let me know your thoughts on this because I think it's really important to get a dialogue going. So tone seems easy because it usually involves buying a piece of gear. I mean, this entire synth tube space is built on gear and the tones that it generates. Gear is an essential part of making music and sound, uh, and sometimes it feels like it's as simple as just taking out your credit card. So let's say you want that Michael Jackson Thriller sound, right, with your hardware or your software synth. Whether you pay $30,000 for a vintage Jupiter 8 or $150 for like a software version, you now have that sound, that tone. But then what? Creatively, you don't really own that sound. I mean, until you tweak it, you play with it, make it unique, maybe build a catchy little melody, create like a legendary production track with a groundbreaking music video. Uh, until you do that, it's not your sound. So on one hand, it's easy to purchase that synth uh, that makes that sound. But at the end of the day, if you are a creative, someone who wants to explore your own unique voice, you just can't buy tone. Making unique tones from scratch is actually really hard, like really hard, especially at the highest levels. That's why vocalists and artists are so prized, right? Their literal voice is unique to a certain extent. But there's also uh, pros out there that are spending an insane amount of resource and talent to constantly research and concoct new sounds and tones to gain a competitive edge. According to Centaurs, the wonderful folks over in Texas who restore vintage synths, that Thriller sound, for example, was actually like a mixture of CS80, a Jupiter 8, and a bunch of other secret sauce synths that Michael Jackson's production songwriting team uh, really experimented a lot with. To be the first one to come up with that sound has to be like this monumental convergence of timing, talent, and good fortune. This really lines up with what I've been thinking about lately, about like the minimalist mindset. Uh, and I know that this is something that you guys are thinking about too a lot. And again, I think it's because we're sensing it. We're all kind of feeling that it's not sustainable to keep adding gear. Uh, even if you have it, you don't have the time. And it's certainly not making me more creative or musical. It's actually the opposite. So, you know, I had this crisis, right? <laughs> like sell everything you know, and just have one synth uh, and learn it to be as expressive as you can. I mean, that may be a little bit extreme, but you know, maybe not. There are so many ways to make your music more expressive, right? It's 
silly to just try to cover them all. Uh, so I'm just going to focus on the one thing that I described earlier uh, with the Minimo French horn example. Uh, and it's about expression using articulation. Okay, so here's a staccato, right? When the notes are played with uh, an attack with a good amount of separation from tone to tone. And here's a legato where there's hardly any separation from note to note. You slur between the notes, right? Instead of obsessing about how the envelope filter sounds, let's obsess more about how to make it more expressive with modulation, filters, and unique ways to bring it to life. I think expression is harder for electronic or sample-based musicians because like, we have to play all the instruments. Uh, for example, like I'm a piano player, so I'm super keen on my piano programming. And it drives me nuts when I hear MIDI pianos being played by, say, guitar players. Um, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter how it's like well programmed, it just sounds off sometimes uh, because it's just the way it's arranged. Uh, but I'm not a drummer, for example, so my hi-hat programming is not all that expressive. So I mean, if I am doing a hi-hat pattern, I need to pay more attention to it uh, so that it can be as expressive and as compelling as it can be. It's not just the sample of the hi-hat, but the way it's expressed. Same goes for a lot of instruments. Sometimes it's not even an instrument. It could be a weird, brand new sound altogether. But paying closer attention to how they articulate may be the best thing you ever did. And it'll save you some money because you'll be obsessing not about acquiring new gear, but how to make the most of what you already have.